right, this is John Cola with OKRaw.com. Today we have another exciting episode where we got two wonderful babies here. We got uh, Murphy over here and we got Lucy down here. They're both greyhounds and these are rescue greyhounds, right? They're rescue greyhounds from the greyhound track, a local greyhound track that races greyhounds and we know that's definitely not a good thing. But the greyhounds have to go somewhere and my friend Susan, who's been into a uh, vegan diet and uh, has been vegan now for the last 20 years and into of uh, being a raw vegan now for about 18 years. These are her pets, and so she's rescuing dogs. And today we're not necessarily gonna talk about dogs, but uh, you know, it's important for me to have the, the animals in here because we're gonna talk about something else that's really important today, about other pets and creatures she keeps at her house. So let's just go ahead and take a look at some of the other uh, creatures and pets she has. If I could uh, get myself away from these two beauties, look at them. <laughs> so some other, uh, quote unquote pets <laughs> Susan keeps are the goldfish you guys can see I'm out in here in her backyard and this is actually a, a defunct swimming pool well it was a swimming pool but uh, Susan didn't like the swimming pool she never used it so she actually converted it into a big uh, pond for native wildlife you know including the fish and she has uh, plants beautiful plants and it's a thing of beauty now instead of a, a hindrance for her and we're just gonna go ahead and uh, give the fish a little food now, uh, sometimes she feeds the fish, but a lot of times they just forage on their own and find their own food, you know, some of the algae, some of the plants in here, mosquitoes that land in here, whatever whatever lands in here, man, is, uh, is, is good fish food <laughs> for the fish. So, you know, uh, Susan does a lot to encourage, you know, uh, pets and also wildlife. So I want to take you to another area of her garden that she actually doesn't keep any pets, but she's growing things to encourage the local native wildlife that has been run out of town by building, construction, by grass, by lawns. So now I'm standing in Susan's front yard and basically 90% of her property are native plants, native to this area where she lives. And not only does she keep animals as pets, such as you know the dogs and the fish you saw, she also attracts animals here, which in my opinion is even more vegan than a vegan who's eating, you know, not eating meats because what are they doing to really help promote wildlife in nature and species that are being wiped out by us? Not only animals are being wiped out in the droves and the millions, so are different other earthlings on the planet. And earthlings are not just, you know, what Martians would call us, not just us, but dogs, cats, ants, bees, plants, trees. We're all earthlings and her place is certified as a wildlife habitat certified wildlife habitat it says this property provides the four basic habitat elements needed for wildlife to thrive food water cover and places to raise their young what better thing to do with your property than to help other creatures on the planet than than to just not simply eat them right so this is huge so I want to go back and actually show you guys like an area that's really beautiful right now it's attracting you know more than just the honeybees but it's attracting native bees, other insects, and pollinators that was just buzzing with life just back here a minute ago. Oh, it's still there. I don't know if you guys can see that. It's probably too small. But there's like, you know, some of our native plants just attracted a, a butterfly back there. Butterflies, moss, all these different things on our property. So I think this is amazing, and I want to encourage you guys to, you know, plant some natives to encourage wildlife to increase the diversity of plants and other earthlings on the planet besides just simply not eating them because I think that's a really what I call a convergent view when you just really think narrow-minded I'm a vegan because I just simply don't eat meat don't do harm to animals but no matter what we do as you will learn in a little bit you know there will always be some harm that is being done on this planet and my goal you know as I consider myself a vegan or something that's you know uh, thinks compassionately and try to think empathetically about these things is to do the least amount of harm you know, but I, I still need to survive at the same time, so there's there's a balance there. Anyways, let's, let's go ahead and take a look at some of these uh, cool native uh, bees and pollinators uh, that I just saw for you guys. So now I'm standing in another area, Susan's yard, and we got uh, like three different vines climbing up this uh, trellis structure thing. And I don't know if you guys look very closely. This is HD, but I don't know how good the camera can pick it up. But if you look, as I sit here, you know, pretty quietly, um, you can see all this activity flying around, like there's bees and insects and creatures and you might see even a butterfly if you're looking pretty sharp you know and uh, these plants here one of them is which is the uh, some kind of native passion flora 
it just smells amazing right here and this attracts the insects to it I mean that's why the plants smell good so it attracts insects so that they will pollinate this because you know it, it, it's an entire food system you know it's a food chain and the insects come when there's natives and the birds come so she's creating a lot of habitat to restore what was taken away because as humans we've just come in in places and bulldoze rainforest down and destroyed massive amounts of habitat and then we put up a house and a lawn and and trees that don't even belong where they're supposed to be planted and it and it and it wipes out habitat for millions of creatures so just by buying a house more than likely you're destroying more creatures than you're saving you know and even if you're just not eating them right but you can do more and go further and that's why I'm here to talk to Susan today because you know as much as she learned that she could create habitat she's learned that she's also has to do some things that she doesn't like so much you know because in nature nature's not there's no such thing as being vegan in nature if you're out in the forest and there's bears right and the bears hungry and you're there guess what the bears gonna eat you the bears are not vegan right we got to do the best we can to survive to protect our food sources you know which every other animal on the planet does which we will talk about in just a minute so actually, I think I see uh, Susan over there. Uh, maybe, oh, what is she? She's maybe trying to do something, catching something. So let's go see what she's doing. So Susan is attracting a lot of wildlife. And one of the things that she's attracting to her property are some little toads. And actually, she's catching the toads. <laughs> and there, there's a reason why she's catching the toads. And actually, we're going to go over that in just a little bit. All right, Susan, so it looks like you caught a frog and, or a toad or something. What do you got there? This is a, um, this is a marine toad. It's, um, it's invasive in Florida and actually in many places around the world. This is that big toad that uh, takes over in Australia. They can get really, really large. Um, this is a baby. Uh, I used to think that babies were cute. Um, all babies were cute, but these babies are not cute um, because this grows into a big toad. It eats our native species. And most importantly, it's poisonous to my dog. So if my dog would bite one of these or get one of these in their mouth, they exude a poisonous, um, they exude a poisonous substance from their parotid glands, which are very, very large. And one of the ways you can distinguish the cane, uh, the cane toad, a marine toad, from a native southern toad. So um, I'm glad to have this. What I'll do with it. Well, let's let's talk about that a little bit later in the video. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So stay tuned. We'll find out what she's going to do with her uh, her toad that could potentially, uh, you know, kill her pet. So another thing Susan does to help nature, help not only the natives, and all, but also her fruit trees, and also provides more habitat and brings more pets in to take care of, she also has honeybees. And you know, bees and honey and all this stuff, it's a big controversial topic in, in veganism because there's a few websites that basically state certain things about honeybees that, in my opinion, are not entirely accurate. You know, I mean, one of the things is that there's this like, uh, in my opinion, dogma out there. Whether that's dogma about slavery or whether that's dogma about veganism and what is right and wrong, good, bad, what you should do and what you shouldn't do, or you know, a dogma about raw foodism. You gotta eat raw 100% because all food, cooked food is, is toxic, is poison. I mean, that's BS, right? Like, dogma is BS. We're, we're, thought, we're taught in our society to think in this whole reductionism principles. Oh. Is, is, is chocolate or cacao good or is it bad, right? And, and, and it's, the answers aren't clear. I mean, some people out there will say, chocolate, man, is the best superfood in the world. And some people will say, it's a toxic stimulant, you know, that's poisonous to you, you know? But the answer is not one or the other. It's somewhere in between. And that's why I'm making this video for you guys to really open your eyes up to maybe possibly think another way and think more divergently instead of convergently. Instead of just thinking right, wrong, good, bad, think, Man, there's a lot of options, man. You don't have to be all raw. You don't have to eat all raw vegan food to get the benefits. You need to eat mostly raw vegan food. And if you, if you have some meat once in a while, you have some processed stuff because you like it once a week, and I'm not going to be the vegan police and, or raw food police and knock down your door. You guys know what's good for you. Do the best. But what I do in my videos, I want to provide you guys options and to think about things critically. You know, this is my 20th year as a plant-based raw vegan. And, you know, I, I, a lot of my thoughts have changed in these 20 years. And I make these videos, you know, not only for you guys, but one day I want my kids to watch this so that they don't have to go through all the learning trials and tribulations that I've done. So anyways, yeah, the, the Susan keeps the, the honeybees here. And you can see them flying off in the background. And she harvests and uses some of the honey. 
And now you can say, well, if she does that, then she's not vegan. And just throw your hands up in the air. And, uh, you know, what I want to do next actually is uh, sit down with uh, Susan and, uh, and share with you guys and talk to her and interview her about keeping bees as a vegan. Because some people might think, you know, vegan beekeeping is an oxymoron. Because <laughs> you can't be a vegan beekeeper. So, yeah, let's sit down with uh, Susan Lerner and uh, talk to her about it next. So now I have the pleasure of interviewing Susan Lerner, and as I mentioned, uh, Susan's a long-term raw fooder, 18 years, 20 years vegan, and besides being labeled vegan or raw fooder, she's many other things in life, master gardener, you know, uh, president of the native, uh, you know, plant society in the local area, past president of the rare fruit council, uh, minister, and I could probably go on and on and on, but I'll stop there, because what I really want to focus on is the label of vegan. And what does vegan mean? If you look on the website, you know, the, the society that founded it, they say, veganism is a way of living which seeks to exclude as far as possible and practicable all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals for food, clothing, or other purposes. So the big question I have for you, Susan, is how can you justify keeping bees using some of their honey and other products sometimes and call yourself vegan? Yeah. I, thought I call myself vegan. B-E-E-G-A-N, -E -E but how do I justify it? It's simple. I'm, you know, I'm a compassionate beekeeper, and there are many of us compassionate beekeepers. And the thing to know about, about bees is, you know, bees really are a, a perfect uh, communal community organism. So the organism is the hive. And then you have your, your individual bees who are, um, you know, they build, they make, they are the hive. But an individual bee, a honeybee anyway, an individual honeybee won't make it in the world. So the, the, the community is dependent on each other and on itself. And so when I take honey or I check on my bees to make sure that the insects aren't killing them or you know, that they're healthy, um, I'm very, 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 very careful. I, I don't lose many bees when I, when I take honey. I, um, I don't take any more honey than um, they can spare. Uh, how do I judge what they can spare? I'll take enough honey so that they'll still have honey to get them through the winter until the next spring. Uh, so I leave a lot of I leave a lot of food for them, a lot of nectar and a lot of honey for them. So. All right, cool. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I see a lot happening is that you know, uh, well-intentioned people who are vegan will make videos and and talk about how bad honey is and. While I would agree with that as a whole and you know, industry and industrialized agriculture that are enslaving bees and, and forcing them basically to make honey, shipping them all over the country on 18-wheeler trucks, netted you know, from Florida to California to pollinate almond crops, all these things, these are absolutely terrible. But you know, at the same time, a lot of vegans will chastise honey and, and don't eat honey because it's enslaving bees, but at the same time, they'll support buying almonds or what 30% uh, of other crops that are pollinated by bees and so I mean another question that comes up is so uh, Susan you have the regular honeybees here but as you guys saw a little bit earlier in this clip I mean she has tons of native bees too so a lot of vegans will say well honeybees aren't really even natural to the North America and that we don't need them so why should we even have them in the first place that's a huge question John we you know, oh God, the, the, the answer has to do with, in part, with how we've developed agriculture in this country. So do we really want to get into that conversation now? But, yeah, I mean, yeah, summarize so, it. So um, honeybees are perfect for agriculture. You bring them in, you, you, uh, um, they pollinate this rows and rows and rows and acres and acres and acres of monoculture foods. But that's not, that's not natural. That's not the normal way of people eating. That's you know completely humanly devised. Um, I don't know. My honeybees are my pets, or my friends, or my family, or my whatever, and I I keep them. They live. Sometimes they die. I, I don't really know where to go with this. So Susan, I know maybe potentially one of the reasons why you keep the honeybees, besides you know having pets and, and helping the honeybees out, because they are being destroyed at massive levels, and by you keeping honeybees. That's encouraging honeybees, and if they're not native to this area, neither are a lot of the different tropical fruit trees that you grow. But as, as I showed you guys before, she has mostly natives here. And, you know, as, as much as, you know, I'd like to embrace natives and creatures that lived here originally, 
you know, we're not living like we were 500 years ago. We've brought in so many different, you know, species that are threats to, you know, uh, humans, threats to the environment, threats to everything. So we need to, I guess, better manage these things. Yeah, honeybees are not invasive. So honeybees are not stealing environment from my, from my native, uh, native critters. They, they, they really do work synergistically and uh, they work together. So um, I have no problem having them all together. They seem very, very happy. There's plenty of food here for them. And honeybees, as you know, will go five miles for food, but my, my bees, my girls don't have to. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I know you have a lot of tropical fruit trees. I've eaten some, you know, and jackfruit and jabatacaba and all, all kinds of cool stuff you have. Your old miracle fruits, your Meyer lemons were like some of the sweetest I've tasted in South Florida. And, you know, I know your fruit production is really important because that's what you eat as a raw vegan. Mm -hmm. And how has your keeping the honeybees impacted your yield and your production on your fruit trees? Oh, I don't think there's a flower that doesn't become a fruit in my yard of, <laughs> of anything, whether it's my native plants or my fruit trees. Everything, everything produces fruit, which, you know, unless you have pollinators, you're not going to have that. Mango trees, however, are not pollinated by bees, so, um, but I still get a high yield on the mangoes because I have the flies that, you know, it's, it's, it's a great, great environment that I've created. Let's put it that way. So what percentage increase do you think you have before and after the honeybees? Because I know you only started that a couple oh, yeah. years ago. Well, I'd, probably 100%. I mean, it, the yield has been just dramatically, dramatically greater. I can't believe how many lemons are on this tree. Yeah, it's I packed. mean, before, before I had honeybees, you know, I'd have three or four. Now there's 30. You know, it's really, it's very, very dramatic. Wow. So, I mean, just alone, if you're, if you're eating plant foods, right, you can create more plant foods on your property by keeping some honeybees doing right by nature, right? And even if you don't want to harvest their honey, have some bees for more pollination, you know, to, to keep them alive. Because if people don't keep bees alive, you know, industrial agriculture that we're <laughs> all in this system are, is not going to do it. They're killing them. They're spraying them with toxic pesticides, herbicides, and miticides and crazy stuff. And Susan does none of that. She does organic veganic, I don't know if there's even a word, <laughs> beekeeping, you know, holistic, whatever words you want to throw in there. Really cool how she's doing it to, to not only help them, but help herself at the same time. And that's really want, you know, one of the reasons why I want to make this episode, to kind of open you guys up. And, and bees are an important part of a system that's not as natural as it would have been, you know, if we never brought them from Europe. But the fact is they're here and we could do something to help encourage them to live like every other creature on this planet should with minimal harm. So the next thing I want to state, and I should have said this a bit earlier in the video, is that you know while I consider myself a vegan, some people may not call me a vegan. You know I try to do the minimum amount of harm in the planet. And while we are talking about honey, honeybees, and this whole thing about honey and being vegan and and keeping bees and being vegan, I want to let you guys know that if you are vegan and you are making videos and me talk telling people about not eating honey and all this kind of stuff, like I, I think that's kind of sad because I think really about being vegan, you're kind of it's missing the point. And we really want to focus on on not just the bees' health and, and the destruction of bees and hives and all this stuff, but of the animals in whole. So really, our, our attention should be focused on animals and the animals that in the thousands each and every day, chickens, turkeys, pigs, cows, sheep, goats, that are losing their lives and that are being, you know, forcibly raped, you know, killed every single day. And honey is just a small, minor issue. But if you've been into this for a long time, for 20 years as I have, and 20 years, you know, as Susan has, you know, these are the things you start to think about and how how life is, and how we're all on this planet, like interconnected, you know, science tries to dissect things like, oh, you need, you know, uh, vitamin C for a cold, you know, but we know, you know, that we need more than vitamin C to protect us from a cold. We need all the phytochemicals and phytonutrients looking at the whole picture or a holistic picture of health than just like, oh, this drug to fix this problem. And, and bees, in my opinion, are just one part of the, the solutions out there. And especially when done appropriately, because I am not gonna say that all honeys are good. And matter of fact, I say, most honey you buy in the store is crap and you shouldn't support those bastards that are doing that stuff. But to say that all honey's bad when like, Susan's here doing it compassionately as possible, taking very little honey, is a totally different thing. And, and I hate people that classify things good, bad, right, wrong when there's good people doing good things sometimes, okay? 
So Susan, one of the really bad things, because there's a lot of bad things that happen in the honey industry, and I know you're you know, uh, in with the beekeepers in this area, and you know a lot of beekeepers, you talk to them to learn from them and all this kind of stuff and share your information and your way of living with them to hopefully get them to even mm -hmm. eat more plant foods and, and raw foods and all this stuff. You know, and one of the things a lot of people say about uh, keeping bees is that, you know, uh, they basically take the queens and they rip their wings off. You know, in, in commercial beekeeping many times, and this is just a statement that's repeated, repeated. Do you rip your wings off your queens, and do you know people in the beekeeping society that you're involved with that rip their wings off their queens? I don't know anybody who rips wings off queens. I don't know anybody, and I, I'm the secretary of the Backyard Beekeepers Association. Um, I'm a member of the Palm Beach Beekeepers Association. I don't know anybody who rips the wings off their queens. We cherish our queens. We cherish them. They're precious. Um, the only time that we would maybe kill a queen is if we have a, a hive that's becoming Africanized and so that the temperament of the, of the bees then becomes um, a problematic societally and so we'll destroy, destroy a queen and um, not let her genetics continue. All right, yeah, so I mean there's a lot of people that just keep repeating the dogma, once again, dogma, dogma, that beekeepers rip off the queens. Now I'm not gonna say, you know, like home <laughs> beekeepers and small beekeepers, they probably treat their bees really well, but once again, it's the commercial farming, the commercial agriculture, when big companies get involved, or even, you know, even owners of a person that own thousands of hives, right? They can't manage them. They gotta just do what's gonna be best for them because they're in for it only for one reason, profit. And so it's my opinion that the bigger problem in the society today is profit, whether that's profit from industrialized agriculture, conventionally grown crops, or even organically grown conventional agriculture crops that are just big agro companies that don't give a shit about the food quality, they don't give a shit about you know, the, the earth, about you know, the resources, about spraying toxic stuff, and, and because they wanna make a buck, not like you know, people that are trying to do the best job they can. So if you, if you do choose, because we all have a choice, to you know, uh, buy some honey, you you have to have to you know buy it from a local beekeeper and talk to him in depth. And we're gonna I'm gonna have Susan you know uh, share some questions with you that you will want to ask the beekeeper to know if it's a more sustainably and and the bees are happy and they're not being mistreated. And don't support farmers that mistreat their bees in any way. I do not advocate that. And don't buy honey at the store. It's crap, man. It's crap. They're they're doing all kinds of nasty stuff, including adding corn syrup to the honey at the store, micro filtering it so you don't even know what's in there and it's just in many cases of poor quality unfortunately. So Susan, another thing I want to talk to you about is like uh, you know a lot of other uh, videos I've seen online when they talk about honey is that they they forcibly impregnate the queen bee and I guess that could almost be considered like a rape. So do you do this to your queen bees and how many beekeepers do you know uh, you know in, in, in inseminate or whatever uh, you know uh, their queens? Yeah so it's a good question. Um, I don't do that. I don't. I don't quote unquote grow queens. I don't. I let my hives um, naturally um, will swarm. The, the bees themselves will create new queen cells, um, and they will grow their own new queens. I don't do that. Um, there are beekeepers who sell and grow uh, queens. They have a queen set up, and they will impregnate queens, and they do that. All right, cool. So I mean, that could be legitimate. So this is a question. If you will, if you are going to buy honey, ask the beekeeper if they do that, and then don't support them if they do. If that is something that's really important to you, I think what I want to do next actually go ahead and head inside, and we're going to talk about the honey that Susan has been potentially stealing uh, from her bees. So now we've come inside, and uh, Susan has some of the products that she actually harvests from her hive, including you know just the the whole honeycomb here, and you know not all honey is raw in the store and a lot of it's being filtered so if you do get a honey i encourage you guys to get a you know raw and unfiltered unheated honey so this is how it comes out and if you were a beekeeper you get some of this stuff and just chew on it and then spit out the beeswax and eat the honey and then also she uh harvests just a little bit of honey you know just skims off the top to leave the bees plenty and i think this is a major problem with industry and most beekeepers harvest all the honey steal all the bees honey and then feed them sugar water or gmo sugar water or even worse corn syrup and then the sad thing is the bees will live on that and that's basically a junk food diet and then they'll make honey based on that food so now you're eating processed corn syrup and sugar gmo sugar potentially second hand in the honey that they're making so a lot of honey is probably not good quality and then the other thing she gets a lot of um, she has the beeswax 
So I personally use beeswax. You know, I'd much rather use beeswax and some kind of paraffin wax made out of petrochemicals, you know, to make my hand salves and hand creams. And I try to get, you know, uh, always my beeswax comes from uh, local uh, farmers, you know, at, at farmers markets. And I talk to them about how they raise their bees and if, if they treat their bees well. Because just like a food could be grown better or worse, you know, so can the, the honeybees. I mean, some of the, one of the things people don't think about is, you know, when, when Susan maybe uh, harvests some of the honey, some of the bees lose their lives. But it's, it's minimized, of course, in, in her operation. But people don't realize that the vegetables you're eating are being sprayed with pesticides, whether that's organic or conventional. And more insects, and bees are an insect, are losing their lives because you're having your food grown with pesticides and chemicals. And even organic farming, they use organic pesticides that kill bugs. When you're driving your car, the bugs splat on your windshield, and you're killing bugs when you're driving your car, right? So no matter what, you know, I've learned that, you know, there will be some things that happen in nature that's not quite vegan, but the whole point, in my opinion, is to do the best you can. So Susan, let's talk about, about the honey here that you've harvested. And some people, you know, that are vegan would say, this is bee vomit, man. And, and they show videos of people barfing and then swallowing it up and then rebarfing it because a honeybee will barf and regurgitate and I don't know what they do. But what's your opinion on this? Bee vomit. You know, I'm so grateful that the bees eat this, eat the nectar, drink the water, mix it all up with the pollen, mix it all up in their stomachs and make honey. This is gold. This is antibiotic, exquisite gold. Um, it doesn't hurt the bees. They don't die doing that. It's their process. It's how they live. They're a conduit for this life-giving food. Um, you know, if you don't want to eat honey, don't eat honey. But it's really great, really great for you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, one of the things that I think about about the the bee vomit. Mean, you can make anything sound appealing, dead to king flesh. You know, for not eating animals. You know. I don't know, fermented rotten fruit, you know, which could be some of the most delectable things or, you know, fermented vegetables and they call them rotten vegetables. Mm. And I mean, I think that's just a, a term that maybe people use to try to sway people to like not eat it. And, you know, to me, this honey, this is this is not bee vomit. This is basically the majority of this is, is like she said, the water and the pollen. This is plant food. This is from plants that have bees have had an interaction with to maybe add something enzymes or whatever it does to it. So it's mostly plant based food. You know, that the bees are just, it's going through them. So it's no different, well, a little bit different than eating like, you know, fruits. You know, this is just mostly plants, pollen, and all this stuff that has beneficial phytochemicals and phytonutrients that are healthy for us. That being said, you know, Susan doesn't harvest that much. She has small bottles because most of it she leaves for the bees. And unfortunately, most farmers do not do this. And, you know, much like me, you know, I mean, as much as I like honey, I rarely ever eat honey, right? I rarely eat it. Maybe once a month, there's this one recipe I use that, that if you don't have honey, it just doesn't work. And it's a recipe I really like. And, and when I buy honey, you know, I get sustainably uh, grown honey. I talk to local beekeepers and find out how, you know, it was made. I, I, just let me clarify, John. I do, I do make larger bottles of honey. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, however, I leave enough honey in the hive to, for my bees to completely eat, have food to eat until spring again. So. I never take all of the honey out of the hive. I take just you know some from the top. I always leave what's in the bottom box, and always leave some in the top box. So they have plenty, plenty of food, and they, you know, they can't help themselves. They keep, they keep making it, and I love it. Yeah. So I mean, there's always overproduction in nature. I mean, if you have a garden like I do, there's so many times when I just have so much lettuce, I can't possibly eat it all. I try to eat as much as I've grown myself, and that's what the bees are doing. They're going out and making their food, and when I'm growing a garden, I'm growing food for me and Susan has extra food here because she has so many tropical things growing sometimes that she shares it with people you know to turn them on and excite them about food and I give away my lettuce and share my lettuce and sometimes I'm not able to and it goes on the compost to get recycled because nature is a recycling system so I rarely eat honey and, and Susan how often do you eat honey I don't know I eat it sporadically and you know when I after I when I take honey out of the hives you know I'll chew on some honeycomb and um, Maybe when I make a smoothie, sometimes I'll add honey, but not always. So I, I don't know, maybe once a week, probably less. All right. And yeah, I mean, she has her own sustainable, as, as vegan as you can get, you know, uh, hives. And that's the other thing, you know, I want to encourage you guys, if you do eat honey, I'm not giving you like the, the okay to eat honey, right? What I say is this, you know, honey is a very concentrated plant-based food that's very sweet and abnormally sweet for our taste buds. And it's quite unfortunate that all you guys out there have been raised in 
for the most part, a standard American diet where they add things like sugar to everything. Everything's so sweet. So we have sweet teeth. And what we really need to do is get rid of that sweet tooth so that we don't and rarely ever even eat honey, right? What we want to eat for our sweet tooth is we want to eat sweet fruits. Fresh fruits are the best sources of sugar in the entire world with a better balance of fructose, sucrose, and glucose for us, small amounts, you know. And if that's not, if fresh fruits aren't sweet enough for you, then get some dried fruits, right? Those are two excellent sweeteners that are, in my opinion, way better for you than honey. But you know, I don't want you to discount honey and, and never eat it if you want to eat it, if there's a recipe or you want to eat it. You know, in my opinion, I'd much rather eat Susan's honey that's been raised, you know, as ethically and veganically if possible, you know, than some kind of processed agave nectar. Because look, you guys just saw the hives. You know, honey is a product of nature and a really for eating whole natural foods as found in nature, not some processed man-made product that was made you know, in Mexico that may be tainted with things, that's <laughs> high fructose, that's, you know, wouldn't even, didn't even appear in, in history in, in, in traditional tribes, you know, at all. It's a new man-made food, and there's a lot of problem with man-made foods. That's why hopefully you guys aren't eating processed foods either, and honey is a natural food, but I, once again, I do not encourage the overconsumption of that, you know, more than once a week, couple times a week at maximum, once a month for me, you know, so I really minimize that. But I don't want to exclude it because, you know, for, for people like Susan that's doing good work to help promote the bees. So another thing that many vegans say is, is that bees have to work incredibly hard to make the honey and they could travel, I don't know, thousands of miles to, to get, you know, pollen and nectar to make the honey. I mean, in some many cases this may be true, but a lot of cases, you know, bees are trucked around to the field so that they could pollinate, you know, almonds and other uh, fruits so they don't have to really go that far. But how far do your bees go, um, Susan, to, to <laughs> make their honey? Well, I, you know, I haven't strapped on a camera, so I don't really know exactly how far they go. But bees will typically go up to up to five miles. Um, but my my intention has been to plant so much um, uh, pollen producing and nectar producing plants in my yard that there's actually something for them to eat year round and. Um, I, I really don't know how far they go, but uh, there's always bees around. And even before I had hives, there were bees here. So there are bees. There are bees out there, and they're in my garden, and they're happy in my garden. So. Yeah, I mean the point is that some bees travel farther than others, and once again, as I showed you guys earlier, Susan has provided a habitat for her bees so that they get to live easy. It's like if you if you if you like your girl and you marry a rich guy or something, or or your girl or your guy and you marry a rich girl, right? You basically got it made, right? The bees have it made here because they have everything they could think of. They got water, fresh water. They got, you know, uh, pollen and things. Right. And, and they got a really nice life. She's providing them a nice life. And unfortunately, in industrial agriculture, they're not providing a bees a nice life. And that is what I reject. So, Susan, let's talk about, um, you know, your, your other animals and pets. We, we caught those frogs earlier. Let's talk about those frogs or toads that we caught earlier. And, and, and why do you catch those? And what, what's going to happen to that guy that you caught? So, I catch the... Um, only the bufo, the marine toads, um, because they are poisonous to my dogs. Uh, if a dog or a cat eats those, they will die unless you get to them really quick and wash out their throat and mouth with water, copious amounts of water. Um, so lots of dogs have died in Florida from bufo toads. Um, but also they're an invasive species here, as they are in other parts of the world, and um, brought to manage something somewhere at some, you know, somebody's good idea that went haywire. And uh, so I catch them and I, I kill them um, uh, in a humane way. The, the humane way to, the suggested humane way to, to uh, dispatch them is uh, by freezing them. They go into hibernation um, and then they don't come out. And so that's what I do and I do it on a regular basis. Um, it's really wonderful to catch the small ones because then I don't have to deal with catching the big ones. Um, but uh, I put them in the freezer in the garage. I don't put. I don't mix them in my um, vegan um, freezer in the house. So Susan, how does that make you feel when you need, when you have to do this? I, I mean, hate it. I'm sorry. Yeah, I am answering your question before you can even ask it. I'm sorry. I hate it. It uh, it breaks my heart. And I kind of tell them that I'll meet them in the next life. I you know very kind. And. Uh, very sympathetic and I know that this is you know part of survival here my survival my family's survival so 
So that brings me to a very important point, you know, I mean, all animals in the world protect their food source, right? And they, they protect their, their tribe, their family, right? If, uh, you know, Susan goes into the hive and tries to, you know, get into the hive and steal too much honey, the bees will swarm and they're going to get her, right? And one of the reasons that doesn't happen so much is because bees know about pheromones. And if you go into the hive all agitated, they could smell you basically and that you're agitated, they're going to be pissed off. But if you're nice and calm and just like, hey, I'm not here to hurt you, you know, I'm being friendly. I just want to maybe borrow a little bit of your honey, you know, that's extra. They're going to be more cool with you, you know, much like other creatures in the world like if you chase them they're gonna chase you and get you and it happens to my dog and my cat all the time they chase each other but most of the time they're just really cool around each other so let's talk about the cycle of life and like mm. how it is you know as being a vegan for a long time and then actually putting in a food forest garden and actually putting in you know a native crops how is it you know been for you having to like manage all this stuff and learning about nature and how nature really works and nature is not a vegan system well it's you know first of all this there's nothing better than waking up in the morning and going for a walk in my garden and picking mulberries and cocoa plums and you know whatever whatever is ripe and ready to be eaten. It's just a delight to have that. Um, it's a delight also to see all of the uh, critters, the butterflies, the bees, the wasps, the the, the the lizards. Everybody just kind of getting along and doing their thing, killing each other. You know, I have these caterpillars, and when I first had my caterpillars. And there's a there's a bug that like lies in wait in the in the plants to uh, you know pounce on the caterpillar and eat it. I hated those caterpillars, those those bugs. But you know I've come to terms with you know I I plant plenty, I have plenty, and everybody wants to live. Everybody, everybody, everything wants to live. Uh, I have goldfish, and I put 50 little feeder goldfish into my pond and my pool that was then, and and then as they were growing. Uh, one one day there was an owl started appearing and I was like oh how wonderful look I created a habitat here's an owl isn't it beautiful and then that owl swooped down and took one of my goldfish I was livid I couldn't I, I was so angry but then I got that I you know I really I created a habitat and uh, that's part of it and so I you know kind of have to let it go it's uh, it's interesting you get attached you know as humans we get attached to other critters and I I get attached to my goldfish. People say don't name them, but I, I've got some of them named. And you know, after the after the heron comes in, I go and I look for Whitey and I look for the other ones and see if they're still there. And I'm happy that they're still there. And you know, it's it's a challenge and uh, it's a lot of work. Um, it's not as much work as manicuring a lawn and uh, you know having um, really um, dead. Uh, exotic plants that su that support nobody, nothing. Um, it's exciting to have to live in this kind of environment. I always wanted to live in a park, and I've created one. I'm really, really happy with that. Yeah, it's quite beautiful. Yeah, if you want to see more of our uh, beautiful park and food forest, che check my other YouTube channel, Growing Your Greens. I have a really good episode where I actually, uh, you know, give you guys a tour of uh, Susan Place and talk more about actually uh, growing food and, and and how Susan has been with that. So, Susan, let's get back to the topic at hand. You know oh, yeah. about. You know, trying to manage, you know, your property here and, and, and be, you know, vegan and, and do the least amount of harm. So, I mean, I mean, so many people buy houses or even if you're living in a house, I mean, you're displacing wildlife. So do you think there's any such thing as living in a house, displacing wildlife, killing animals so that you could live in a house and then you have this whole property you need to manage? And I mean, what are your thoughts on all this whole process? Well, I, I don't want to live in a sterile environment. I want to live in the world. And... You know, if the world is dead around me, you know, I could be in a shoebox, and that's not where I want to live. Um, so I have to come to terms with things die. Things die. My dog sometimes will kill a critter. That's what happens. Um, sometimes a critter injures my dog. That's what happens. Um, I don't know how else to answer your question, John. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's the circle of life, man. It's tough. I mean, I have a little dog, Oakley. Many of you guys may have seen the videos. And then I had, I had feral cats, you know, neighborhood cats. And one of the cats had, had kittens in my, in my composter. And I've never shared this story on lot before. But one of the cats had kittens in the composter, you know, because it was being unused. And I guess it was a good place for a cat to have kittens. And I'm glad I provide a habitat for a cat to have a kitten safely. And then I think the mama cat abandoned the kitten, so now I had four kittens to take care of, and I thought that was really cool. And Oakley would see them, and he wouldn't really do anything with them, but then, you know, 
um, they were growing and they had like the alleyway where they were living and um, well, one day I, I come outside from my bedroom from working and then in, in, the, in the kitchen floor there was like a small dead kitten and I like totally yelled, I'm like, no! And I cried, it was terrible and I had to <laughs> pick up a poor kitten that wasn't alive and dispose of it. It was not fun. <laughs> so then, so then I went over and I built a fence so Oakland couldn't get the other ones because I wanted to save their lives. And then I built a fence and then it kept Oakley out. But then the other, but then two of the kittens got in the yard and Oakley got them too. <laughs> and it was terrible. So then I went over to the last kitten I was crying because he was the last one. And I'm like, I'm going to save you. Nothing's going to happen to you. I'm going to protect you with my life. And now he's my pet. So this is a reality that I've had by, by having pets. And then I've had, I kept pet ducks. And I, I wish the best for them. So I know what Susan's going through. And this is just a cycle of life. We need to embrace and not live in a box. And not just think we're a vegan because we're not eating animals. We need to do more. So, I want you guys to see, look up to Susan as a model to create more habitat for wildlife, to create more habitat for creatures on this, on this planet, to watch the movie Earthlings and do the least amount of damage you guys can because that is possible. And in my opinion, it's not possible to live in a box, to box yourself up in a dogma called vegan, to do no harm because always harm will be done, but you can minimize that harm. And I want you guys to think about all the actions you're taking whether that's buying conventionally grown food that's being sprayed with pesticides that's not good for you and it's not good and it's killing bugs out there right because that's the broader message of veganism that I want to spread I don't want to be the vegan that just simply eats vegan food and thinks with blunders on that everything's all right I'm doing the best I'm all right because I'm a vegan think outside the labels think outside the boxes Susan do you have any last comments you'd like to add well you know we live here we came here, we think that we're, you know, we're the masters of all, and we're not. Really, it's time for us to get uh, humble and um, really be with that we're part of a web of life and to be responsible in that web of life and not master of that web of life. We, you know, we go places and we mess things up a lot. You know, we, we transport, we transport toads and we transport plants and we transport all kinds of things across across boundaries across habitats and we think that we're doing a good thing but we're not we're stupid it's too much that we don't know to be to be making big mistakes like that that have really huge implications and repercussions so you know get educated learn learn go to your 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 extension office learn about being a master gardener learn about planting native plants learn about uh, taking out invasive plants, learn about, there's so much to learn. Read about Doug Tallamy and the work that he's doing in uh, uh, University of Delaware with his native plants. And there's, there's much to do and y you can do it, we can all do it, even if we're growing plants in a pot. Yeah, I mean the one thing I think that is the worst for the world, for veganism, for non-veganism, is commercial farming. Whether that's commercial animal farming, which is absolutely terrible, or even commercial, industrial, organic, even, or conventional agriculture that you are supporting every day by the food choices you're making as a vegan. Grow your own food. Grow your own food. That's the number one thing you can do. And grow your own food. Grow food like Susan has done here, as well as native crops mixed in. One of the things that I've learned here after seeing her amazing, beautiful yard that I got to take the best pee that I ever took in my life. So I'm <laughs> peeing and these butterflies are flying around me and it's just so serene is to, that I'm going to grow more native plants in my, yard, in my yard. Even if I'm not eating them, you know, it's for the, the creatures so that I will get better pollination and I'll help the planet out as a whole. The last, thing about, the last thing about native plants is that, so you plant natives not just for pollination because that's very, that's again very egocentric. We're planting, we're planting natives because we want to build a, a, an ecosystem that supports everything. So you're planting native plants, you're planting them for the birds, and you're planting them for the caterpillars that the birds will eat, and you're planting them for the, you know, the birds that the birds of prey will eat. You're, you know, you want to develop a world that's like alive and teeming with life again, instead of this kind of sterile, you know, row upon row upon row of empty houses that we build. It's, we can do it. We really can. 
and we need all your guys' help because if you continue to live in the commercialized you know, uh, system you know, where you are a consumer instead of a producer, th this is what is going to happen because you are, right. you are encouraging the wrong things to be taken in our world that is being destroyed at amazing rates because of money, because of profit, right? So, I gotta get running, I got other videos to make today, Susan's gotta get going too, and if you guys enjoyed this episode, hey, please give me a thumbs up to let me know, I'll come back and do more episodes with Susan, she is a wealth of knowledge, every time I come and visit, I speak here, you know, I, I learn things uh, from her, she learns things from me, and this is how things need to happen, we can learn things from everybody in the community. If you do live in the South Florida area, I want to encourage you guys to join her meetup group. I will put a link down below. But when I do talk in South Florida, this is where I come. You want to visit her potlucks, uh, you know, visit all the things she's involved with. This lady knows a lot, and you can learn a lot from her. And you know, it'll advance wherever you are in your journey, you know, to the next level, in my opinion. So, uh, Susan, any contact you. websites you want to share really quick with people? Uh, well, the meetup website, meetup.com forward slash vital longevity raw. Um, Basically, I announce all the things that I'm involved with there, even the beekeepers, the uh, Native Plant Society, the Rare Fruit Council, all that gets announced there. And um, friend me on Facebook, Susan.Learner. Awesome, Susan. All right, so yeah, if you enjoyed this episode, once again, thumbs up. I'm going to come back, Susan, next time in uh, South Florida, make more videos here talking about this kind of subject that really you're not hearing on any other YouTube channel because this is, you know, taking me like 20 years to come up with all the different ideas I've taken from many different places and put it into like one thing, and this is what I've been led to at this point in my time and I'm so glad that Susan has actually pretty much come up with a similar idea and actually making it happen in her yard. Um, also be sure to check my videos, my past videos, I have over 400 videos uh, educating you guys about all aspects of a raw food diet and how to just live lighter and healthier on the planet and be sure to click that subscribe button down below, very important, uh, you know, so they'll be notified of new and upcoming episodes. I have episodes coming out about every five to seven days. Uh, to educate you and to enrich your life and to and to move you in the right direction in my opinion and be sure to share this video with others you know people that are vegan that are really hard line you know against honey you know i want to open them up about to think about more than just being vegan about how to live lighter on the planet and yes how to be as compassionate and empathetic as possible as well because that is one of my really really big missions in life so uh once again, my name is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. We'll see you next time, and until then, remember, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're always the best. All right, this is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. Today, another exciting episode for you guys, and this is going to be a fun one at that. I got my buddy here, Paul Nissan, that I've known for, I don't know, like a long time, uh, over 10 years easily. And I really get to see Paul because he lives on the other side.